54 years, four months and 24 days after the ballad of John and Yoko topped the charts, the Beatles are number one again. And with sales of 19,400 copies, Now and Then has become the UK's fastest selling vinyl single of the century. I'm Andrew from Parlogram, and after the emotional roller coaster of the last 10 days, here's my reaction to all the events before, during, and after the release of Now and Then. Burnt out and embarrassing, so why can't the Beatles just let it be? All you need is hype. Cashing in on yesterday. It was always going to be a disappointment, wasn't it? That was how the press greeted Free as a Bird back in 1995. Thankfully, reaction to now and then has been more positive. And while I wouldn't go as far as to call it a masterpiece, it certainly is an incredible achievement by all concerned. Although I missed the 60s, this isn't the first new Beatles single I had the pleasure of buying. That was this one, Movie Medley, which has become little more than a fever dream. But the journey to owning this was like no other I've ever experienced. Ever since Paul blurted out that he'd completed work on it last June, the wait among Beatles fans for the release of Now and Then has been tortuous. Unlike Giles Martin, who had never heard of this track until Paul played it to him last year, most fans who are familiar with either John's original demo, bootleg versions of the 1995 sessions, or various fan-made YouTube videos, we kind of had an idea of what to expect. But such was the security surrounding the finished article. Not one second was leaked before release, which I find remarkable. The big announcement was initially to have taken place on August the 10th, but the problem was that someone hadn't done their homework, because that was the day that Taylor Swift had chosen to announce the release of the re-recorded version of her album 1989. So the Beatles announcement was cancelled, and the wait went on, much to ours and Ringo's frustration, which was evident in an interview he gave on September the 6th, during which he was asked about when the track was coming out. Can you tell me if it's coming out this year? I can't, okay. because it should have been out already. <laughs> <laughs> so it's coming out when they decide it's coming out. Fair enough. I've done my part. <laughs> The announcement was then rescheduled for September the 27th, which also came and went, leading to rumours that we might not actually see anything new from the Beatles this year. Then finally, just eight days before its actual release, came the announcement we'd all been waiting for. Now and Then would be released worldwide on Thursday, November the 2nd. But before we heard the song, we got the cover art. At first, some thought it was a kind of placeholder for the real cover. But no, this was the actual artwork for the single, and the reaction to it was almost overwhelmingly negative. It was created by the artist Ed Ruscha, who also designed the cover for Paul's 2020 album McCartney 3, and coincidentally has a career-spanning retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art in New York called Now Then. It's certainly more White Album than Sgt Pepper, and a long way from the charm of John's drawing on Free as a Bird or the mid-60s promo shot on Real Love. Although I like minimalist design, I find this pretentious and depressing and would have preferred something more genuine and nostalgic, perhaps. To me, this is seriously unremarkable and adds nothing to the music it houses. The rear cover for me is much better, which shows a quirky little clock made by an Oregon artist named Chris Giffen, which George bought in 1997 
and remains with the Harrison family today. On the day before the song's release, Apple put out a 12-minute official documentary written and directed by Oliver Murray, entitled Now and Then, The Last Beatles Song. I thought this was a great piece, and seeing new footage of Paul, George and Ringo working together in the studio back in 1996 was utterly captivating. Apparently, there's over 14 hours of film from those sessions, and we really need a documentary about that. That film also gave me the first goosebump moment of the week, which came when they played John's isolated vocal for the first time. I know it's true It's all because of you This was going to be incredible. So the big day had arrived, and to be honest, I was nervous. What if I didn't like it? In fact, I waited some hours before listening to it, stretching out the wait just a little bit longer. Yes, I was excited to hear a brand new Beatles song, but also aware that it might be the last time I would experience a brand new Beatles song. I remember sitting in my car on a cold, grey December day back in 1995, as Free as a Bird was played for the first time on the radio. And I remember how that song had moved me back then. And now, 28 years later, I found myself profoundly moved once again. Now I think you'll find that there are many who agree that Now and Then was not one of John's strongest compositions. And I don't think he rated it that highly himself either. But that's not the point. The fact that this exists is enough for me. However, for all its technical wizardry, the lack of a major contribution from George, who was so prominent on the previous two singles, is for me the biggest disappointment. I know that by retaining his original guitar part and adding a tribute slide guitar solo, Paul tried his best to give George a bigger presence on this song, but for me, it doesn't sound as authentic as Free as a Bird or Real Love did. I'm sure that it's to Paul's eternal regret that he didn't push them harder to work on it back in 1996. Another significant issue is the removal of the I Don't Want to Lose You bridge, which is on John's original demo. I understand why it was deleted, but I think it would have made for a more interesting, although slightly less commercial song. But don't get me wrong, creating something of this quality from a half-finished lo-fi cassette demo is without question a remarkable achievement, and I'm truly thankful it exists, and we've had the chance to finally hear it. But the excitement was not over yet. There was one more gift to come. Although initially reluctant, Peter Jackson was persuaded by Apple, with the promise of access to rare footage and a free hand, to create a video to accompany the song. Jackson said that his intention behind the video was to quote, bring a few tears to the eye. And that's exactly what he did for me. It is, I think, an amazing video, which manages to be both ridiculous and moving at the same time. Although not as arty as free as a bird, this video for me succeeded in adding a new dimension to the song by making it less sad, more entertaining and genuinely heartwarming. Although some have criticised Peter Jackson's treatment of archive footage with regard to the elimination of grit and grain and all that, I think he's a godsend to Beatles fans. Unlike Giles Martin, who himself admits he's a poor Beatles scholar, Jackson is a massive Beatles fan who really knows his stuff and is crucially the only one of the Socks and Sandals Brigade, as Giles likes to put it, who has any influence over what Apple might do in the future. With him on board, projects like a reworked anthology or the restoration of the Star Club tapes are a real possibility, 
Not to mention even more footage from the Get Back sessions that's all ready to go. So guys, don't knock him too hard, and I think we will be rewarded. Now it wouldn't be a Parlogram video without a deep dive into the sound quality. So let's take care of that right now. My first listen to Now and Then was through these. And it's for these which I think the song has been primarily mixed for. Later on, when I played it through the speakers on my main system, I was really disappointed. It sounded congested, monotonous, bass heavy, and overall very muddy. The mix, I think, buries the strings and squashes Ringo's drums, which sound a million miles away to how wonderful they sounded on the Abbey Road album, for example. But of course, they were recorded in a different way. A few days later, when the 7-inch vinyl arrived, I tried again, hoping there would be an improvement. But it sounded just as bad. Rather than try to dodge YouTube's content match system, allow me to try and show you the issue with the help of these waveforms. This is the waveform as recorded from the 7-inch vinyl. The blue area, the waveform, represents the amplitude or volume, if you like, of the signal. The orange colour behind, which is not as important in this case, is the spectrograph, which shows the strength of the frequencies. Now from the beginning of the track until about the 42nd point, here, things look good and sound fine. However, at around that 42nd point, the compression kicks in, and by one minute, the track is completely saturated, giving you this thick, solid shape, which makes the track too loud, even at low volume. This 12 inch weighs in at an impressive 182 grams, and due to the grooves being spaced wider apart, is cut a little louder, but still has the same sonic issues as the 7 inch. Now this isn't cutting engineer Miles Scholl's fault, he can only cut what he's given to work with, and it's clear that the decision to make it sound like this was taken further up the chain of command. Thankfully, however, everything sounds much better on the Dolby Atmos version. Here's the waveform of the vinyl version again. But look how the shape of the waveform changes when I switch to the Atmos version. As you can see, it's no longer a solid wall of sound. It has peaks and troughs, dynamics, and really does sound excellent. The Atmos version I listened to was from iTunes, which you can get if you have a subscription but it's also available in that format on other streaming platforms too. Now you don't need to have a 12 speaker setup to enjoy the benefits of Atmos mixes, just a compatible set of headphones, such as these AirPod Pros. Most Atmos mixes sound very similar to the regular stereo mixes, but as in this case, most have much improved dynamics. If you've had the opportunity to listen in this way, do let me and everyone else know what you think in the comments. Now the B-side of the single was originally to have been an instrumental of Now and Then, but Abbey Road cutting engineer Mal Scholl said that it was his idea to put Love Me Do on it instead. After Apple agreed, Scholl went to work at Abbey Road de-clicking and removing the flaws from two fairly worn out original UK pressings of the single, because as you probably know, the master tape for the original single version was destroyed back in 1963. Quite why they wasted time restoring two worn out 45s instead of getting a mint copy from a collector is beyond me. Anyway, the restored track was then sent to Peter Jackson's team where it was demixed, and those stems were then sent to Giles Martin to make a stereo mix from, after which it was cut at half speed by Miles Shoal. Thankfully, Love Me Do doesn't suffer from the same loudness issues as Now and Then, and as you can see from its waveform, it's very dynamic. Also, the stereo effect is very subtle and not overdone. They've added a touch of high-end sparkle and a little low-end thump, but this was a decent recording in the first place, and there isn't a night and day comparison between this and the original first pressing 45. But to be honest, I'm more than happy with Sean McGee's mono cutting on the 2019 singles box, and for me, this song isn't improved by the stereo treatment. But we'll be talking more about that and much more when we come to review the new Red and Blue albums. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on that.
Although it may well be the final new music created by all four, I don't like thinking about this song as being the end. New tracks will surely come to light, and Demix Software has already created new releases. And who knows what's stashed away in private archives, or even in Apple's own. I'm going to give the final word to an anonymous first-generation fan who was quoted in this article in the Mail on Sunday from 1996. She was, of course, talking about free as a bird, but her sentiments could equally be applied to now and then. I honestly have no idea if Free as a Bird is an utterly wonderful song or a pile of old donkey do, and I don't believe anyone else has either. The best part of it is that it's a wonderful excuse to listen to all those other blissfully brilliant songs in what has become an orgy of retrospection. So I don't care if Free as a Bird is good or bad. I'm just adoring feeling 14 years old again. I really hope you enjoyed this video and that you'll leave a comment about how you feel about Now and Then or any other topic we've covered in this video. And last but not least, a massive thank you to everyone who subscribed to the channel because we've now reached that incredible milestone of 50,000 subscribers. And rest assured, I'll continue to do my best to grow and improve the channel as we go along. There's still so much to do and I have a very long list of videos to make so I hope you'll stick around as it's your comments and support which keep me going. I hope I'll have the pleasure of your company next weekend when we'll be looking at the new Red and Blue albums. But I'm done for this one, so I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much and God bless you. You've got a lucky face. The end.